Hi everyone, I'm Vic Gatto, your host for Harnessing the Healthcare Storm. Super excited to have our guest on today, Dr. Chris Magrata, really great doctor. He's a doctor of pediatrics, works with kids in North Carolina. That's incredible to learn about how he treats kids and families, but also he's married to a dietitian and got really curious about the causes of disease and holistic care, integrated medicine. And so we dig into the changes in the healthcare industry, huge, as you know from my other, my other shows, huge coming disruption in the healthcare industry. We get Chris's perspective on that. And then we dig into nutrition and holistic care and the role of food of med as medicine. Really insightful. He's a great guy, great guest, kind of brings complicated information into an easy to understand package for me and for you all. Uh, please watch, it's gonna be a great show. Again, Dr. Chris Magrata uh, from North Carolina. Chris McGarrett, thank you for coming to Harnessing the Storm. We're really excited to talk through this with you. So uh, just give a quick summary of your background. You're a pediatrician in North Carolina. Talk about your practice and how you got to where you are. I appreciate it, Vic. Thanks for taking the time to speak with me. So my story begins uh, a good bit ago, traditional medicine, went to school in New York at Vassar College, hopped down on the the uh, car ride down to Atlanta, Georgia, and spent four years at Emory. Uh, really enjoyed medical training. I knew what was going on in the medical world. Then took a leap over to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Spent three years there and really, truly thought I knew the science of medicine after coming out of residency. Uh, because I met my wife there, who's a nutritionist, um, we met uh, while she was in her uh, RD train while I was in my internship year. We ended up migrating to Charlotte, of all places, even though we're both from New York. And in my Charlotte time, I moved to a small town called Salisbury, which is about 45 minutes north of Charlotte, and uh, joined a really an old established practice, currently 65 years old, called Salisbury Pediatric Associates, and began my career there doing traditional medicine. Um, what really changed my career course was seeing patients that we couldn't affect change in. And my wife at the time had been spending a fair amount of time following Dr. Weil, uh, I, in my, I, in my infinite wisdom, thought that I knew pretty much the, the sum total of medicine because of my training, and she was disavowing me of my beliefs routinely via stumping me constantly on nutrition questions or just a various uh, uh, assortment of, of questions I couldn't answer, and it was very frustrating. You know, I came out of Emory thinking, again, I was well-trained, but turned out I only had 16 hours of nutrition training, but well over 1,000-plus hours of pharmacology, another 1,000 hours of pathophysiology, and I felt lost, right? So at this time, years had gone by, and uh, about 2004, I started reading some of my wife's Dr. Weil newsletters, and uh, one of my colleagues at that time was interested in this stuff as well, and said, hey, you heard about this fellowship in Arizona? And I said, what is it? She goes, oh, Dr. Weil started a fellowship for uh, doctors to learn the other side of medicine. I said, really? So I looked at it, looked great, talked to her. And I said, you know what, I'm going to sell this to the partners to get us to go out there. So my partners decided to pay for us to go. And we flew out there over a two-year period and did an online uh, course called Integrative Medicine and learned the data of what I didn't know and really confirmed everything my wife was saying through the science. Uh, you know, if I dial it back a little bit, I always had an eye for the outside-the-box thinking. When I was in residency, one of my favorite professors uh, Frank Salisbury was an immunologist, and Frank never looked at the world the way most of the doctors did. He looked at it with abject skepticism. He would always try and find the, the missing piece, very much like House, the MD TV show. And, and Frank really spent time forcing us to think in a different way. Why is the problem there and not what to do about it right now? We'll deal with that, but where did the problem stem from? Where did the breakdown occur? And, and that curiosity stuck with me. Uh, so, you know, fast forward back to post-residency, I come, I mean, post-fellowship, um, I came out of the program guns blazing to start changing the world, you know, at, at Salisbury seeing patients. And what I really learned quickly was that it's very difficult to do this sort of medicine in the traditional model. So we can get yeah, to that so in a minute. It's interesting, when I, when I try to think about the healthcare industry overall, you had a couple advantages. You had a mentor early on that sort of taught you to really look for the source of the, of the medical problem. You ended up 
getting a relation, into a relationship and then married to a registered dietitian. And so had right. that perspective as you were beginning your practice. Um, right. And you have sort of a curious view of the world. Let, let's, let's try to learn more and try to find the answers as opposed to kind of blinders on and go forward. Not all doctors have that perspective in my experience. You know, you're exactly right. And, and, and I found that through trial and error. I, as I worked in the hospital and worked in different settings, when I bring this information up, and it's hard science, it's not even leaps of faith anymore. I find that I'm constantly looked at with, with this, you know, I don't, there's not enough time to talk about that, so why bother? Or, you know, we really don't have time to learn this stuff. We're too busy dealing with EMR. There's always an excuse for why not to. And, and, and that is more often than not the answer. It's frustrating, but it exists. Yeah, so tell me about your, your uh, program with integrated medicine. What did you, how did you approach that? What did you bring to that? And then what, what did you learn while you were there? Did you study the, the facts and the science of it? Or how did you, how'd they approach it? Yeah, so Dr. Weil heavily f focused on nutrition, pathophysiology based on nutrition, and then also really uh, surprisingly deep dive into the mind-body component, which is not taught at all in traditional medical schools. So we learned everything there is to say about how the mind controls stress responses, and that invariably contributes to disease risk and disease outcome. That was really probably the, the crux of the information that I learned. And then trying to dial that into the day-to-day -day clinic, we really looked at, I was very fortunate, the practice that I'm in is independent, it's not owned by an institution, so we can make decisions that are best for the patient, even though economically they're not really good for a business model. I, I will do two hour long consults uh, at least two to three times a week. And the pay structure on that is it's a waste of time from a pay per perspective, but it's a great thing to do from a patient perspective. So my practice has decided to subsidize it through the rest of the patient visits or the regular traditional model. And then they allow me to see these higher end patients, even though I lose money on it because the outcomes are greater in the long run. And so that's sort of our model. It's a very difficult model to transport as I've learned trying to teach it in Arizona when I went back because most clinics are now owned by hospital systems and the desire to allow for longer visits in order to change the outcome of the patient isn't there. It's actually, again, short-sighted in the sense of prevention isn't really warranted from the hospital's perspective, even though it's probably the number one thing to do from an outcome perspective in the long run. Yeah, so, so let, let's talk about that. I mean, I have a, a prediction or a thing that I've been talking about on, in this program that I really feel like we're on the cusp of the healthcare landscape going through a pretty massive disruption, really due to four trends. And, and they, all, they all begin with a misalignment of incentives today and then sort of a resetting of that. Right? And so today you have large systems with an insurance company or a payer paying, maybe it's the government, maybe it's a big insurance company, and the patient is kind of disconnected from that. They're, they're present, but they're not in the middle. And I see sort of four different things coming simultaneously in the next four to 10 years that are going to really shift that. One is just the rise of the consumer. Consumers are having more financial responsibility. They're getting more uh, attention put, placed on them, more uh, decisions being placed on the consumer. So they're, they're becoming in a position of power more. I think care is moving outside of the hospital. The, the hospital is as the center of the health ecosystem is shifting now and more and more care is outpatient or going to the community or the clinic or the home. I think there's technology tools, data, data science, um, you know, big technology tools, artificial intelligence, new diagnostic tools, new understanding about nutrition that I want to get into with you later on that are really helping us understand more what should we be doing in a longer term. And then lastly, there's market entry from new players that are not traditionally in healthcare. So you can pick the name, right? But Apple, Google, Amazon, et cetera, that are jumping in, Walmart, that I think are going to really shake things up and kind of realign incentives so that it's much more, much more able to take a longer term view. If, if, the, if the goal is let's reduce cost in the next five years and keep people healthy, maybe taking right. an hour with a patient and teaching them to take care of themselves might be beneficial. So get, right. get your sense of that, that sort of disruption coming. Do you see it in your practice? Uh, what, what are you seeing out there around those trends? 
So I would take it from a couple of different perspectives. I think the first one, clearly disruption is coming and it's, it's here. Just look at the big players that are coming in right now. Businesses are realizing very clearly that it's cost prohibitive to try and keep pace with the rate of inflation in regard to costs of health care for their employees. So they are shifting the burden back to patients. We're seeing this hot and heavy with patients not paying their bills, patients being frustrated now with the fact that their bill is X when they used to see a $20 copay, didn't care, have a care in the world as to what that actually meant. Uh, asking for ad nauseum services because, again, it was covered by some big system. That's definitely disrupting the way people see. Consumers are now becoming more aware, and I'm glad for that, actually, because that does put everyone in the position of we have to look at how this cost structure system is in place. I think, secondarily, the disruption from the big boys, you know, Apple and Berkshire Hathaway, they have a vested interest in this working because, again, from the business perspective, line item expenses, healthcare is insane. My own personal practice that we own, we spend an inordinate amount of money on the healthcare of our 60 employees. So I would love to see that come down. So, yeah, I, I suspect that that's coming, and I think they will do exactly what you're saying, leverage wearables and technology, which we can get into later. The, what you Just to rephrase, the big tech players, big employers, whether it be Apple yeah. or Berkshire Hathaway, they're going to bring uh, diagnostics and wearables and data and try to align interests where people are kept healthy longer and not just you know cured when they're when they're really sick. Is that right? Let's just take type one diabetes and type two diabetes. They are ubiquitous in the environment, and you know one of my best friends now has a continuous glucose monitor and a pump where he gets infusions of insulin basally as well as randomly hooked up to his iPhone and his iWatch now. He tracks his trends much more real time, which then will decrease, you know, in, in our terms, the amount of, of, of time where glucose is above this magic number of 180 milligrams per deciliter, which causes all the side effects we see long term, whether it be renal disease, you know, neurologic damage, you know, all, microvascular disease. So that in and of itself is, is tech that's available now. And again, why every single diabetic doesn't wear it makes no sense to me. But I think that's the, the beginning stages. Now you look at things like the Aura Ring, which is something I was telling you about a yeah. couple of weeks ago that I wear. It has dramatically changed how I see my sleep pattern. I've always thought so that So describe the Aura Ring. I'm not sure the whole audience knows the Aura Ring. Just describe that because it's an incredible piece of device. Yeah, so the Aura Ring, I'll show you right here. It is a little, uh, it looks like a carbon fiber ring with three small adapter uh, diodes in it that pick up multiple different uh, vital signs. Mine specifically reads my uh, heart rate while I'm sleeping, heart rate variability. It picks up respiratory rate, temperature. It has a gyroscope and accelerometer, so it picks up movement and position in space. So it tracks my sleep to a T. It tracks my movement. It tracks my calorie burn. Burn, and it also tracks my uh, basically my uh, readiness for the following day. So if I have a rough day, I don't sleep well, pe my variability is way off. It says, hey, tomorrow's a good day to take it easy. So that in and of itself could be tremendous for preventing heart attacks. It could be tremendous preventing stress-induced secondary complications. So if you had a huge fight with your son, your wife, your boss, your, your, your heart rate variability may change dramatically. And you may get signals saying, hey, today's a day to sit in the sauna. Or today's a day to sit on the back porch and meditate. I think that part of the tech alone is, is invaluable if we can train folks to use it. Um, yeah. This is just one of many, and it just is the one that I was turned on to by one of my favorite podcasters, Dr. Peter Atia. And, and well, he, what I really like about it is it's, it's that and the glucose uh, monitor and sort of um, automated process. They're more passive. Right? Like you, are, you put it on, and then it tells you during the, during the morning, today's a good day or today's a day to take it easy. Correct. And, the glucose monitor is monitoring, you know, continuously and then feeding more glucose if you need it and more, I mean, uh, more, more, insulin. more insulin if you need it and then not if you don't. And the patient yeah. doesn't have to engage and sort of make these decisions all the time and remember it's sort of always going on. Correct. And I, and I think just to the other extent, you look at something like a Fitbit, the early iterations of getting into the wearable world and the, the low yield on the Fitbit, many, one, because the tech wasn't very good, two, because basically all you're getting is steps and a couple other things. Right. That, that's not very actionable. Most of the wearables need to be actionable. There needs to be something you can iterate a change on to improve your health. Um, as opposed to, you know, something that like the new iPhone, iWatches that do EKG monitoring, that has value. You, you fall down as an elderly person, the EKG picks up an arrhythmia and sends a signal to 911. Uh, that's an immediate great. Right. So, yeah, that, that's, that, 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 I definitely think leveraging tech is going to come. The question is, what is the breakpoint on cost to allow it to become ubiquitous at the patient care level? 
you know, other things, you know, when I look about care moving out of the hospital, absolutely necessary. Hospitals are, are, are just raping patients left and right. I actually have a personal experience recently. My wife just went to a physical therapist. I was unaware of where she went. She rolls into the hospital where they sign up the physical therapy in the hospital. We get a bill back for $1,000 in facility fee. Right. So I asked her, well, what did they do? Well, nothing. I sat in a chair and they talked to me and then did a little, so you didn't use a machine. Not, so I right. called the hospital. I raised yeah, 50 bucks in an outpatient, yeah. an outpatient one. Yeah, exactly. And, and the problem is, is they're getting away with this legally. Patients have no idea. There's nothing up front. And I'm even in the business and didn't know it up front. So that needs to change. So I'm very grateful that actually some of that stuff is coming. And then, and then you look at, you know, just the, the rise of the consumer. Consumers are getting pissed off, frankly. They're tired of paying big bills. Number one cause of debt in the country right now, bankruptcy, is healthcare costs. So I think it needs to become transparent. I think we need to have almost like a, you know, walk into Kidoba, see a menu of the, car, of the charges, because that will allow people to make better choices. The big concern I have, and this is uh, unfortunately coming fast and furious, is the rise of the urgent care model, where, you know, the, the quality isn't so much of importance to the patient as the speed of getting in and getting out and the, 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 the rapidity of diagnosis. When we see on the back end, when they come to follow up in the primary care office, the misdiagnosis, the mistakes, you know, and that, that's, that's a bit of our frustration in the world. But again, I think it's here because consumers prefer that over quality. Uh, you know, I, I mean, one of the local hospitals, Novant did a big study years ago, and number six was quality of provider. Number one was convenience of location. Number two was convenience of time. So we have challenges coming, but I, I think you're exactly right. I think the business model, of costs and the business entities are going to disrupt this enough that hopefully it'll trickle down from the outside because there is no way the medical complex is going to do this from the inside out and nor the government. Government's making traditionally bad decisions, not good ones. Yeah, I mean, as you know, I'm a venture capitalist, right? So the, the change is good for the change agents and the new entrepreneurs kind of coming up, but it's painful to go through. Yeah. <laughs> the, the challenge is that Unfortunately, the, the industry is not likely to innovate from the inside and fix everything without pressure from the outside. So we're probably right. going to have to go through a period where there are outside entities and when, maybe they're big Silicon Valley folks, maybe they're small people there in Charlotte or here in Nashville doing something that's innovative and really yeah. good, um, but then pressure the industry to make changes. And what, right. what I love about your practice, the reason I wanted to talk to you is I think your practice sees it more as a calling to help people. And yes, we're going to lose money on this hour long consult, but we'll make them healthier. And that'll be good in the next year, two years, three years, and better for the patient population overall. Yeah. And I, and I could speak to that obviously, because I live it daily. You know, one of the reasons I joined this practice, because it was almost that altruistic belief system from the get go. One of the senior partners who's now deceased on my first visit with him said, Chris, listen to me. Worry about one thing, the quality of the outcome of the patient. Everything else will fall into line. You don't need to worry about it. And I can tell you that has been some of the most golden words in my ear since I started 20 years ago. It has never been a concern of mine financially to survive. It has always been the end result of what are we putting into the mix so the patient comes out of the mix healthier. And I'm fortunate, like I said earlier, that my partners align with the belief system and we all are pushing this functional integrative medicine model where it's prevention first always. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's not perfect. It would be nice to have an hour per patient per day, but it's, it's inconceivable financially. But right. we, sprinkle, we sprinkle preventative integrative functional medicine on every single patient. And for your listeners who don't know what that functional integrative medicine model is, it's essentially traditional medicine with a bigger toolkit. So instead of just relying on, let's say, asthma medicines, I'm going to look at the patient first and say, okay, what possible food reactions are you having? What possible micronutrient deficiencies do you have? What possible uh, sleep or exercise problems are you falling prey to that are worsening your disease? Let's hit those first. And right. then I have a new set point that says, okay, you are now here. Let's see what drug need you have now, which will probably be significantly less than it was before. In ADHD now, I won't treat patients for ADHD unless they will allow me to help mitigate the, the, the lifestyle factors that are making their disease burden worse. Because then what happens, they get on high-dose drugs, and they get side effects. They right. won't. Right. They yeah, so let, let's, take, let's, take, let's take either one of those, but, but I want to unpack that a little bit just for the, to get into it more. So when you have an asthma patient come in, instead, I mean, probably 95% of primary care physicians or, or physicians in general would prescribe a medication 
and send right. them on the way. And you know, when, within the seven minute office visit window, you're done and you, you bill it in the EHR and they get their drug and they go on. When right. really there's things in their environment or their diet or their lifestyle that are not very hard to fix that are causing 50%, 70%, 100% of their asthma. And yeah. the, the medical establishment is kind of papering over that and treating the symptom forever. They're going to be on this drug as long as that's going on in the environment. Right. As opposed to a simple fix of you shouldn't eat this, right. this thing that you're sort of, you know, isn't treating you well. Uh, is, yeah. that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, and I'll give you a case example. So I had a young boy, 12 years old, came to me from an outlying clinic about an hour away, never, never seen the patient before. Mom comes in, says, I heard you do this stuff. Can you help me? Child had been admitted on average two to three times a winter. So whatever that cost comes out to, it's 15. Yeah. Admitted to the hospital. Admitted to the hospital, right? Yeah. So expensive. Plus not, to, not even to discount the fact that he's on IV steroids, IV drugs, yeah. you know, heavy burden to the body. So I looked at him and said, let's, you know, it was about an hour visit again, sat down, talked to him, went through the environment, went through the history of his diet, and then drew some labs, frankly, and looked at micronutrient status. Was he low in zinc and vitamin D? Did he have some um, potential uh, immune-related uh, reactions to food? And, and it turned out he did. It turned out he was significantly reactive to two foods, dairy and egg. We looked at his micronutrients, found out he was low in, in zinc, low in vitamin D, low in iron. We basically just said, all right, let's talk about anti-inflammatory diet, which essentially is a diet uh, very akin to the Mediterranean diet. We, we discussed changing up refined processed foods, get them out, get rid of certain things, eliminate dairy and egg, and then started some micronutrients, put them on vitamin D and zinc, and then and said, hey, stay on your meds for now, right? Let's yeah. see how you do it. So a year goes by. He doesn't get admitted once. He's now coming back for his follow-up at, at three-month intervals. By the, by the fourth follow-up, he's essentially asymptomatic. So now we're talking about downplaying his medicine needs. So yeah, let's, let's taper him off or let's, let's yeah. do a little bit less. Yeah. yeah. Fast forward now, he's four years out, not on any medicine, says albuterol is a backup for if he plays sports, and he feels perfect. And, and again, that's not an N of one. It's, it, his is an N of one, but I've got countless stories like, like his, and it's just simply individualized each kid you the, the problem with medicine is we reduce it down to it's got to be a protocol it's got to be this it's got to be that every kid's different and every individual has their different set of genes their different set of epigenetic um, changes and so we look at them all with a loose uh, loose framework and then we we follow the path the way it leads us based on what the story tells us per kid and then we alter everything with essentially the similar principles diet stress reduction uh, you know, avoiding chemicals where possible. If he lives in a house with tons of Glade plugins and and animals, we talk about that. We test yeah. them to see. What yeah. So, so essentially, uh, of, of uh, say a thousand doctors, how many even understand this way to treat patients, and then how many practice it out of a thousand? Ooh, I you know I, I'm purely guessing. Clearly, I, I would say less than fifty pediatricians out of a thousand are are practicing it. And I would say less than 100 out of 1,000 understanding it, in my experience. When I go around and talk about it, people are mystified that this is out there. Right. Uh, I think it's changing. You know, there are now more than 20 major institutions teaching medicine now that are going down the functional integrated medicine pathway, Stanford, Harvard, University of Arizona. So it's coming. But the problem is, is that it's too slow. Yeah. Um, right. And really so, exciting discussion. We just were digging into uh, – some of the medical schools are beginning to talk about functional integrated medicine uh, in their training of new doctors, new physicians, as part of the part of the training, part of the curriculum. But it's pretty slow. And so, Chris, talk about the timing of change in healthcare. I mean, I have a, a really interest in, in this because healthcare is is different than other markets, right? So, um, travel, financial services, e-commerce have been completely disrupted and reinvented, uh, media been reinvented by technology, by Silicon Valley players. Right. I hear every day as a VC, well, healthcare is different. It's regulated, people's life is at stake, and the FDA is involved, and you can't change it. And I think that's, yeah. that's right and wrong, right? It's, it's correct to say that you have to be careful and cautious. People's life is at stake. It's different than, you know, if, if an Uber driver messes up, okay, it takes me a longer time to get home, you get lost or whatever. That's different than heart surgery. Uh, right. But 
the same time, we can't put our head in the sand and act like there's no need to change because like the patient you were talking about earlier, his life is much better off, off drugs, off dairy, and sort of living a natural and healthy life. And so talk about change coming to healthcare. I think it might flow through kind of the pediatricians and the primary care physicians, uh, but talk about where you see it coming first. So, I mean, if you want to take a 30,000 foot view, you know, I, I really think it's going to start at smaller institutions like mine. You know, you look at where some of the great research is coming out of different uh, centers where guys who are brave, willing to step outside of the box, you know, the, the Jonas Salks of the world who are willing to put smallpox in to see the outcome. You have to do a sense of a drop of no harm, right? So when I talk about functional medicine, integrated medicine, we immediately go into the, to the, to the first place of Come. Like right now, I'd love to do fecal transplants, but there's too much risk right now. There's the data showing that there's a chance you could put somebody into a secondary disease. So we'll wait for a little bit of safety to come. But going so back talk to about that, just so people understand, you could do a fecal transplant, meaning help someone improve their their uh, biome in their right. uh, large bowel, large intestine. Um, right. But, and that would be largely successful, but there's a small risk factor. Is that what you mean? Right, so currently it's only uh, viable for people with C. diff colitis, which is an overgrowth bacterial infection post antibiotics. And it's killing people every year. 25,000, I think, was the last number I read. So they've okayed fecal transplants for that because it's a last ditch effort. Yeah, so let, me just, let me just unpack this. So they have a, a significant antibiotic to kill something else, correct? And it destroys all the, all the positive uh, microbiome in their intestines. And then it's they like have that. a secondary problem. Is that right? right. So the, the good bugs get wiped out and what's left is this bad bacteria called C. difficile. And it starts to cause a colitis, which is inflammation of the colon, which then causes basically a dysentery where you're losing uh, diarrhea constantly until you die. So they've okayed it for that procedure and it works tremendously. 24 hours after the fecal transplant where you're giving this healthy biome from a donor and you give an enema or basically you flood the colon yeah. with these good bacteria and they're healed in 24 hours. That's beautiful. And that we want to start iterating this into other diseases. The problem is there have been cases where they've done that and then the person's developed rheumatoid arthritis or a secondary disease within weeks of the transplant. So it's not this simple, you know, no risk scenario. So we need more data, right? And I'm a big fan of let's look at doing things for humans but also can't be careful of the risk, right? So, you know, independent practices, big institutions who have independently thinking uh, physicians working are where we're going to see iterative change, right? So in our clinic, like I said earlier, we're willing to take significant change in patients if the outcome risk is low, but the high end yield is high. So we will iterate change constantly. And the good news is we're nimble enough. We don't have this uh, bureaucratic nightmare that the big hospital systems have where you have to wait six months to a year to do anything. For example, you read the newsletter that I write every week yeah. and, and, and I send that out to everyone for free because I just want to educate. You know, if I tried to do that in a health system, they'd say no because one, it's not approved every week by some board. Uh, secondarily, there's, there's, you know, potential that they don't agree with what I'm saying and, and that puts a huge burden. So therefore, the 99% of the data that it would not be disagreeable with, they won't send out. And I know this because I have friends who'd like to do it are not allowed. So yeah. that, whole, that whole change engine is, is just slowed down by the bureaucratic nightmare. And, and, I, and I see, again, the, the nimble practices or the nimble institutions that are willing to make change faster sort of rising to the top as consumers become smarter. You know, for example, our practice patients drive one to two hours to come in. You know, and I, I don't look at that as we're great. I look at that as they're willing to put that much burden on their lives because they know they're going to get a better outcome than they are in their local community. It's sad on one respect, and it's on another respect, it's, it's what patients want, and they're willing to drive. So I think that also tells me we're on to something. We're doing yeah. something right. Well, I mean, you're doing something that we just talked about. Out of 1,000 pediatricians, maybe 50 are doing it. So they can't get this full holistic treatment in their local community, they have to drive a while right. to get to you. So, right, but to, but to my mind, less risky, like giving up aspects of your diet, trying to, what if we give up dairy and eggs and add in some vitamin D? There's not a lot of risk. If you watch the vitamin D, there's not a lot of risk at that having significant side effects. 
Right. No, not at all. And I'll tell you a story that's really comical. So I went to, I was doing a lecture to an autism group. It was about a hundred doctors in Charlotte. I was one of the three speakers and we were talking about autism to so the physicians that were there. And we we're talking about restrictive diets and autism, how these children don't like to eat. And I said, you know, one of the things we do do in autistic patients, we try a gluten and dairy free diet because we know that a subset of the population tremendously responds to this diet. One of the providers in the back of the room said, said, well, you, if you put him on that gluten and dairy-free diet, you're going to make him completely nutrition, nutritionally deficient. And I said, wait a second, what is he eating right now? And the doctor said, well, he eats hot dogs, chicken nuggets, french fries, and potato chips. And so I said, do you think he's nutritionally sound? He goes, absolutely. And, and it, was, it was a moment where it struck me. Now, granted, this was 15 years ago, so I was still pretty junior. But it struck me like, wow, that's the level of training that we have in medical schools. Yeah. That, 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 he, that he's a nutritional train wreck to start. Yeah, and, you know, bringing them to a gluten-free diet will be different but healthier than, than yeah. what he's on right now. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and again, like I said, it's, it, it, the subset of the patients that it works in, it's phenomenal. And then yeah. the other patients that it doesn't work in, we just dial it out then. You know, it's a, right. it's a two-month trial. Nothing works. You say, hey, didn't work. Fine. Let's move on to next, next pasture. Yeah, I mean, I, I love those experiments where there's really no downside, right? The, the, there's a chance... And whether it is 1% or 30% is immaterial, there's a chance that it will significantly impact positively your child. Correct. And then, you know, there's a chance that it won't. But there's no negative side effect to it. You can't eat right. potato chips for two months. Right. Uh, that won't kill you. That's good. Probably better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, talk to me about the move from – kind of innovational medicine where, where you, you, the patient is sick and we need to do something to, to fix them versus kind of keeping them well and holistically looking at the entire, the entire body. That, that's a huge shift in the thought process. And how do you, I mean, you made that shift through your career. We talked about you had a mentor early on and your wife is really involved in this and your practice is, uh, interested in holistic medicine for the regular provider, how are they going to make that that transition over the next five to ten years? So I'll give an example. I had a cardiologist who used to come to our office. We we rent space to some specialists to come up to make it more convenient for our patients to be seen, uh, and 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 he despised what I was doing. It was sort of interesting. And I again, I was young. Uh, I was sort of taken aback well, by he's why. He's an ignatio cardiologist. Like he, he is trained to like go in through the vein and, and fix the problem. Fix it, right, yeah. So, it, it, so he, he, through word of mouth, I heard that he would bad mouth the things that I was doing, voodoo this, voodoo that. Yeah. And again, it was sort of impressive to me because there's nothing we're doing that's even remotely voodoo. But yet, what a blah, blah, blah. So something happened. So needless to say, his granddaughter came to see me unbeknownst to him. Um, his, his daughter had brought his, his granddaughter to me for an issue. And lo and behold, it turned out it was dietary. We fixed it. Mom went home, changed up the diet. The kid goes from being abnormal to normal. And he became one of my number one referral sources after that. Mm -hmm. And, and it, was, it was one of those moments where I think a lot of this, it, it, it stems from almost like you have to put your finger in the, in the hole to see that the stab wound occurred. You know, people in medicine are very siloed in their belief system. I was taught this way at Stanford. There's no way what you're saying can be tricked. Otherwise, they would have taught it me at Stanford. And I yep. think once they start to see these outcome changes and outcome shifts, then the, then the proof's in the pudding. And, and, and that's ultimately what I find to work the best because I can present data all day long. I can hand paper after paper. And, and, and I'm still amazed at how stubborn folks are to change pathways. Yeah, it's interesting because they, every doctor is a scientist at heart and they're looking right. for, um, you know, it's called a practice. They're looking to sort of get their way of treating patients better. If you, if you talk to a surgeon about a new surgical procedure, a new twist, or a new way to access the organ they're working on, they'll go to training and they'll work on that, they'll learn that, or a new, maybe a new medical device that's slightly better. Right. They love that. And, right. and the pharmaceutical companies and the device companies are very interested in, in selling them because they usually are more expensive. That, that is sort of ingrained in what it means to be a doctor. It's continuously improving outcomes, improving procedures. But if you go to preventative care or holistic care or something that is not in the specific specialty in cardiology or in nephrology, then 
then it's vid all of a sudden it's voodoo, even though it's still based in statistical data and science, just right. not the science they're ingrained in. And right. it, it seems like a cultural thing that has to be sort of pulled through, and it might be another generation of physicians that come up with it before it's really fully changed. You know, ironically, who's going to do the change is women. When I go to the conferences and uh, functional medicine, integrative medicine, the room is more than 50% female. And by and large, women are more open. And I think it comes down to women want to fix their children. Women want to fix their, their tribe. And my wife just finished writing her book, Nourish Your Tribe. It was a, it was a study in... I'm frustrated watching children not eat well. I'm frustrated watching this all. You know what? I'm going to put this out there so people have something to read, even though it was a labor of five years of hard work, which I'm not too sure I could pull off, right? There's something about women's tenacity, women's sense of, I want this to change, and they're going to bust chops to get it done. So part of me really thinks there's more women entering the, the medical space. There's more women entering, you know, healthcare, and they're the ones who are migrating toward this alternative, quote, unquote, functional medicine world and they're doing it the right way. So part of me thinks that's going to be part of the solution. But the, the, the other part, I think you're right. The old generation as they expire, retire, a lot of them being pushed out early because of EMR. Um, that that's one less person you have to, to deal with. And then younger generation is more open-minded by nature. Yeah. So I think that, so that, that makes sense to me. Another thing I wish want to get your thoughts on, cause I, I, my, and my VC, we're investing along this thesis, which is that, uh, there's going to be an ascent of the primary care of the pediatrician in influence and impact in the space. And obviously, I'm preaching to the choir probably here, but but I think that the specialists have been dominant for 50 years or so. Right. Right. Um, but now the the referral patterns are going to be sort of driven out of primary care pediatricians, and I think as consumers come in and big employers like Berkshire Hathaway try to take an interest and really reduce cost and drive better outcomes, they're going to start looking at these holistic care, preventative care, integrated medicine, not because it's a calling for them, but because it has better results, right? Just pure and simple, it's going to be better and cheaper and more effective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, insurance companies, uh, you know, if you look at the insurance company model, the average person sits on insurance uh, companies' books for three to five years. So yeah. what's the insurance company's incentive for the 25-year haul? They have none. So they're out of the game, right? right? So really, truly, it has to be either the provider, the consumer, or some other entity, like you're saying, that has a skin in the game, a business that's losing lots of money, right? So I, I entirely agree that's going to be the route to, to, to get down to this road from the primary care model we are perfectly positioned, and I think the government gets this now, to control the cost structure. Mm -hmm. I know when a referral is needed in general, right? You know, right. It, and if I'm not sure, I'm going to make the referral. But if I'm dead sure that this doesn't need to go on, I'm not spending it because the cost doubles. Like, for example, just even going to the ER. We pride ourselves in our practice on being open more to allow patients not to have to go to the ER because as soon as you get to the ER, your cost doubles to yeah. – you know, goes up by five multiples. I know this well, person – I mean, the cost doubles. It's also – worse for the patient and a hassle and not right. as good medicine and the data is not collected in their, in their record in the right place. And there's a whole bunch of derivative issues with that. Right. But you know, the problem is like, you just think, let's just take the Medicaid MCO issue going on right now in North Carolina. Medicaid is now splitting into four MCOs that are owned by, will be owned by four private insurers, Blue Cross United, WellCare, and a fourth to be determined, right? Overhead goes up. All right, fine. We can live with that. But let's say, you know, you know, the state government's giving a certain amount of PMP money per member per month money to the insurers to then give back to us in, in theory to help do a little bit more of that legwork on social determinants of need, where those are missing, so therefore they're ending up in the ER, which is a cost problem. They're ending up in the hospital, which is a huge cost problem, or they're just not getting care at all, which then becomes a monster problem. Yeah. Turns out we're looking at the contracts, you'd be amazed. They're holding all the PMPM PM money for themselves. And right now the contracts we're seeing, there's no money for us to do that legwork, even though we are the perfect system to set it up. So there, there's still that disconnect. The state knows it needs to be done, but they're not mandating the companies to do it. You know, yeah, they're not, they're not forcing the, uh, they're not driving incentives or forcing it to actually get into holistic care. They're doing exactly. the right thing and sort of paying per member per month but it doesn't flow through the, the physician's action that can deliver it. 
Yeah. I mean, it's like, well, what's the point of giving the money if you're not going to, I mean, unless, unless United or Blue Cross is going to send out social workers, things, news, which is fine with me, yeah. but I've never seen it. And, and frankly, most of the money gets punted to the adult Medicaid patients because that's where all the money's wasted. Right. So, you know, again, it, the incentives. Are uh, really yes. Good. I read your newsletter every week. I'm also, uh, I haven't finished your wife's book yet, but I have it. I've started it, but let's talk about nutrition. Cause, um, I think we all know sort of intuitively that diet is important. Of course, diet is important. We are what we eat. All these kind of old wives tales that our grandmothers tell us things that we should remember. Um, you look at America. I was just was flying yesterday and going through the airport. Everyone seems like they're overweight or obese yeah. in the airport these days. I think that's because most people are eating too much and obese. But I really want to dig into the, the link between food and nutrition and inadequate food to chronic disease. So I think it's not just, gosh, I'm a little bit overweight and I should lose some weight because it would be more healthy. I think there's a much more direct link to serious diseases. And people get, get frustrated with me, uh, but, but I think you can cure diabetes, congestive heart failure, asthma, allergies, if you fix diet. And that's not always true, but talk through your understanding of diet linked to uh, chronic disease. So I, I agree. And I think it really depends on how far along down the disease scope you are. You can take even the Alzheimer's now. If you look at Dale Bredesen's work out of UCLA, uh, it's phenomenal. He's the first person to ever uh, halt or reverse Alzheimer's disease. Now, we're talking about an industry of pharmacologic drugs worth $7 billion of abject failure. He has a program out there. And, and at the, I think it's at the Buck Institute. And they, he has a paper, his first paper was 10 patients looked at, and nine of the 10 had halt or, or starting reversal of disease. One did not, and that was because the disease was too far along. So, I mean, we're talking about some of the hardest diseases on the planet were stopping or reversing. Cure, it depends on the situation. I certainly think you can put certain diseases back in the bag. I think in asthmatic, for example, you can certainly make them appear cured, but if they decided to pick up smoking, work in a smelting factory, something like that, you can turn it right back on. Yeah, so but, I, guess, I guess cure needs to be defined more clearly. I, I think, let's say the symptoms are, are at least alleviated or neutralized enough that they, don't, they no longer need medication and they're not a health risk anymore. Yeah, so I would say, let's say the disease burden is gone. Okay, yeah. Right. Like that's why they, they're, they're, their sense of well-being, their sense of day-to-day -day feeling, how capable they are of doing their day-to-day their, their, their -day existence is good. That's my sort of barometer of am I doing a good job? Because, you know, we have the cautionary tales too. You know, I had a young child that I took care of with Crohn's disease. Now, for the listener, Crohn's is a very bad autoimmune disease that is a colitis, which is an inflam inflammation of the gut. And, and it causes severe disease, will eventually kill you. They, in general, they have to use very strong drugs. The younger the kids are, the harder the disease is to treat. Well, I had a patient years ago that was young, beautiful, and we had her well controlled on an integrative approach with some medicines and, and, and things were going well. But, you know, there was a, a social change in the family that disrupted how this young girl saw the world. And she basically at that point started cheating, eating food left and right, not doing what the plan was, and her colitis erupted. Yeah. So my well, I mean, is, I mean, stress is integrated into it. Right. Uh, pressure, obviously, if you're on a nutritional treatment protocol and you don't follow it, just right. like if you didn't take your meds, correct, you expect the same results. And so I think I think if stress in the family life changes, you can sort of hold on to from a diet point of view. I mean. The, the Indians in Bolivia, I, I'm not going to move there. You, you <laughs> have acronyms DASH and SAD that, that I've been sort of trying to follow. Give right. me the, those, those landmarks to go from. Because I think those, those are easier perspectives to take and, and more, more functional. So that's all the processed foods, kind of things that are made to sit on the shelf for 15 years and not go bad. And I've gotten in trouble in, in a couple other shows about naming brands. In a yeah, negative. I'll stay off that. I'm not going to say negative ones, but like, we all know what they are, like the, the right. not-so-healthy things on the shelf. Uh, right. So, fresh food. Yeah, so sad diet, standard American diet, which is essentially exactly that. Processed food, highly refined, lots of saturated fat, lots of carbohydrates that are you know, flour-based. Sure, and it doesn't matter what kind of flour. It's potato flour rice flour, corn flour, wheat flour, and then loaded with sugar, added sugar. Even ketchup is loaded with corn syrup. 
So that's the standard American diet. We know what that's doing to everybody because, as you said, you walk down the airport and you see it. Then there's the, the, the DASH diet, you know, and, and, and DASH is basically an, an acronym for diet to stop hypertension. And, and, and that diet is essentially whole foods based, no refined foods at all. It's low in dairy, but the dairy that's there, low fat dairy, which I'm not a big fan of because when you make something low fat, you add more sugar to it. So I, I'm against that a little bit. But and it's low in meat, but higher in chicken. And then the third diet that we tend to talk about the most is the Mediterranean, the anti-inflammatory diet, which is a bit higher in, in the, the olive oil world, a bit higher in some of the um, uh, things like chocolate, red wine, which is not really talked about in the DASH diet for, for, for being good. And the Mediterranean diet seems to be the one that works the best. Right? I think where the Mediterranean diet starts to fall apart is when people start to refine the foods again. If you start adding in refined carbohydrates consistently, like, for example, Italians, they don't eat plates of if you go to Italy and you eat at a restaurant, it's a little bit of pasta. In the American Italian restaurant, the plate's bigger than your head. Yeah, so there's right. a disconnect with what the true Mediterranean diet was and the New York American Mediterranean diet. Even pizza, if you look at a Neapolitan pizza, it has very little cheese on it and, and red sauce on it. Nothing like the New York style cheese pizza, which now you actually paradoxically can find in Italy. So the Mediterranean diet is more of this heavy, heavy, heavy vegetable fruit-based diet, nuts, beans, seeds, lots of uh, olive oil, fish, chicken, and then and chocolates and things. But I, I think that's ideal. If, 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 there, if the followers that are listening to this want to look at a, an ideal paradigm, Dr. Weil has an anti-inflammatory pyramid on his website, or you can Google Dr. Weil's anti-inflammatory diet pyramid, and it lists in order what food really should be. And I think it's probably the closest thing to what we need. The my plate, the my government stuff sort garbage. Of I would follow on impact on cardiac disease and other things. Because I think that that's less talked about in forums like this. And I think inflammation is really a key driver to all these things. Yeah, I, I think it's actually ground zero for almost every disease. Inflammation is essentially the term we use for when the immune system goes to attack something. Let's say you get kicked in the foot, right? And you stub your toe. The healing process is to bring in the immune system to, to break down broken cells, broken tissue, kill pathogens if they happen to get introduced during that injury, and then repair it and clean it up and walk away. If that system's fully functional, everything resolves. You go back to normal. There's no inflammation. You're good to go. If it doesn't resolve, then you can develop this cycle of inflammation that actually begins to snowball. And then you start to have what's called local damage. And local damage begets more local damage. So I think about like throwing a bomb, and if it blows up just in that little micro environment, nothing bad happens. But if you throw up a big bomb and sends out those little marbles, they can do a lot of damage. Well, that peripheral damage is what we start to see of as disease. So for example, let's take diabetes. And you get glycation reactions, which is a really fancy name for a reaction that occurs called the Maillard reaction, where protein and sugar cross-link because the sugar saturation in the blood gets so high that all of a sudden these abnormal complexes form. Well, what does the body want to do with them? Well, the immune system says, I need to get rid of you. Yeah. Well, if you don't stop doing this, right, because you keep eating your sticky buns and donuts, and you know, you may end up with a world where you're sitting there in inflammatory state. That inflammation... Yeah, so your body is trying to correct the problems in a constant state of inflammation and, and you know, attack mode into these things that are abnormal, into the sugar protein complex, is that right? Right, and so if you get a little sugar load and then you stop, it heals and it's gone. Yeah. But for those folks that don't change their diet ever, you can't stop it. So that gets to your point earlier, can we reverse this? I think absolutely, because if you change the diet, you get rid of the inflammation. Human bodies want to heal. By nature, that's why I went to pediatrics. You go onto the pediatric ward and you see a child with, that, uh, with pneumonia. The first day you may be lower down, but then the next day he's breathing with an oxygen tank and he's running around the unit even though he still needs oxygen, right? Because yeah. by nature, they want to heal. So if we just give the system the tools to heal, it goes away. So I think removing sugar, removing the triggers for inflammation. And again, inflammation can be triggered by anything. Toxins in the environment, you know, smoking, right? That's a clear toxin, air pollution. And then food's a huge toxin burden. So you have the bad fats, you have bad foods, refined carbohydrates, you have, you know, sugar, sugar beverages, high fructose corn syrup, all of that drives this inflammatory burden. Then it just depends on your genetics, whether you develop ADHD or asthma or cardiac disease. And, and, and then, you know, essentially you just go down the snowball's path until you either stop it or it kills you. Yeah. Now, one of the concerns I have is that there are lots of 
ads on television and other places for things that are going to hurt us, right? So alcohol, not healthy foods, uh, and then we have lots of medications that the pharmaceutical industry will <laughs> sell us to fix the symptoms related to that. There's not a lot of advertisement around eat a salad and an avocado. Maybe an avocado has some advertising, but in general, there's not a lot of healthy food advertising to counterbalance that. And so it's, yeah. the population doesn't, doesn't know. Yeah, I think that behooves the government, unfortunately, to make that decision to do it because you're right, there's not enough money in it from the other perspectives. I think once they deregulated direct consumer marketing from the pharmaceutical industry, that put a huge burden upon society to make better decisions. Let me just take Larry the Cable Guy and his commercial for, you know, the antacids. Say, go ahead and eat your chicken wings, here's your antacid. Full well knowing that the statistics show clearly that when you stay on these NSs long term, you increase your risk of food allergies, you increase your risk of, of bone issues, you increase your risk of infections. So there's a huge disconnect between society. And again, the, 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 the pharmaceutical companies don't have a vested interest in you knowing the truth. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. Pharmaceutical industry is there to make money. And unfortunately, that paradigm causes them to maybe gloss over the moralistic code, but it's legit. Uh, you know, they're, they're, there's no doubt that they are glossing over the moralistic code on these things because we all know statistically that it exists. So, yeah, they, they, they will, you know, fit the regulations and quickly list all the side effects where I can't understand. Yeah. And, um, but, you know, I think that is their job. They're incentive to sell that. I mean, they have shareholders or they have, you know, they have to do that job. We have to try to be educated consumers and understand. And right. what's interesting is, I think there's a great opportunity now to invest in kind of change agents that are bringing tools to help you live healthier lives or pick better food or services to keep you healthier or diagnose, diagnostic tools earlier that are bringing right. Yeah, I, let's dive into that quickly because I've, I've had an idea for a while and I, I can't seem to get anyone to bite on it. I don't think it's cost beneficial for like from your perspective to invest in, but I think it would be great from a governmental perspective you know, let's say all my asthmatic patients, I have them on a speed dial for Twitter or on a speed dial for Instagram, whatever these yeah. kids follow. Yeah. And if it's, if it's an orange day outside for, for pollution, I get on there and quickly tweet in the morning, hey guys, orange day might be a good idea to take an extra hit of your inhaler or maybe a good idea to stay inside a little more. You know, give them actionable, random information, like another day, like, hey, why don't we think today about eating three cups of broccoli because of the sulfurophane and, and other chemicals in there that are protective. So, you know, something like that, I think, is a simple fix. But, again, nobody's jumped on it. And I don't, again, I don't think there's much money in it. But from a, from a cost perspective, you know, the, the downstream effect of that prevention could be huge. Um, yeah, and I think that we're, things are coming pretty quickly for healthcare, not quickly compared to other industries, where the alignment of, uh, I think CMS is doing a lot of work trying to align uh, the payment structures to keep people healthy um, yep. to encourage investment in messaging boards like that or new diet plans or new, new treatment facilities, kind of integrating behavioral and diet and exercise and acupuncture along with more traditional medicine altogether. It's just slower than I would like. So I, think I agree entirely. Value-based care is coming. We're going that way in the next uh, calendar, probably starting in 2020. <laughs> hey, well, thanks for your time. This has been a lot of fun.